Welcome to a bonus episode of the Voice of San Diego podcast. I am Scott Lewis, Editor-in-Chief at Voice. So, if somehow you haven't heard, as we talk and talk and talk about it, we hosted our biggest event of the year, PolitiFest, last Saturday at the University of San Diego. It was filled with discussions about housing, transit, homelessness in San Diego. So we've got uh, so many different panels. Um, We didn't get all of them into the feed, but we did get some, including this one. Uh, I sat down with homeless advocate Michael McConnell and Gil Cabrera, an attorney and a board member of the San Diego Convention Center, to discuss the measure uh, to increase the hotel room tax to generate funds for an expansion of the Convention Center, homeless services and roads. So Gil Cabrera was for the measure. It will be on the March ballot. And Michael McConnell was against it. And I, I thought it was a good discussion. We, we really got into it. Um, I asked, I thought, were some b- pretty tough questions for both sides. And uh, they handled it pretty well. So here's the audio. I hope you enjoy it. Just to be clear, we cannot thank um, people enough uh, for both coming to the event and all of you volunteers and sponsors who helped make it possible. So you know who you are, and thank you so much. Uh, um, it, it's uh, very moving for me to be part of an organization that people want to help that much. So thank you. So here's the audio. Enjoy. All right. Welcome. The city of San Diego has almost put on the ballot. Is it done yet? Almost. A measure to increase the hotel room tax. My name is Scott Lewis. I just moderated a, a panel discussion with far too many people, so I'm looking forward to uh, one with just two. Probably should have uh, thought about that. I always have a rule. You should only have four or less on a panel, but I broke it. Um, Won't do that again. But here we are. We are faced in March with a decision um, to uh, raise hotel room taxes in the city of San Diego, Um, and it's it's sort of in a concentric circle. So if the hotel room is in downtown, it will be 3.25%. And if it's, uh, if it's outside that area going to the 54, it's 2%. And if it's outside that area, but it's still in the city of San Diego, it's 1%. So it's, uh, it's uh, the closest places to the convention center will have to play, pay more for the convention center expansion. But unlike previous uh, proposals, uh, they've also included in this one uh, funding to support uh, homeless services and to support road repair. And so what we are going to debate here today is whether we should pass that or not. And I'm excited to have on my right, Michael McConnell. Uh, he's a, a homeless advocate, uh, part of Funders Together for homeless, uh, to Solve Homelessness, and uh, become a very uh, high uh, uh, profile critic of the city's homeless po- uh, policy. Welcome, Michael. Uh, and to my left, uh, Gil Cabrera. He's been the chair of the Convention Center Corporation and an advocate for the expansion of the Convention Center and supports the measure. Uh, he's also been on the city's ethics commission and he ran for city attorney. Uh, welcome, uh, my friend Gil Cabrera. All right, so let's just get right into it. Maybe you both can take a second and establish your credentials for the audience about this measure. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Cabrera. So uh, why... Should people believe you when you talk about this? And why do you support uh, passing the yes for a better San Diego measure? So I've served on the uh, board of directors of the convention center uh, for six years now. I'm about to term out at the end of the year. Uh, The important thing to know about that is that it's a volunteer position, so I'm not paid by the convention center. I'm not a member of the campaign uh, for obvious reasons. What I do is run the convention center and uh, make sure that it stays the economic engine that it has been for the last several years. Um, And so from a from a policy perspective, obviously, I come at it from a, you know, this is this is a figurative golden goose that keeps giving to the city of San Diego. It's one of the few city assets that actually nets money to the city, even under the most conservative uh, view of it. when we look at it, we know that it has 1.3 billion in economic impact for the city just this last year alone, and that was a, a near record year for us. Uh, it employs uh, over a thousand people uh, throughout the year. Many of them have been there for 20, 30 years longevity, uh, and so I come at it from that perspective of knowing the the benefits that we get from the TOT tax um, and how we can expand those benefits instead of just capping what we get for the future, and then use those benefits for quality of life issues throughout the city of San Diego. 
Great. And just to clarify, so the city of San Diego, if you stay in a hotel room in the city of San Diego, you pay, or your visitor friends pay, 10.5% uh, of your bill to the hotel room tax. Uh, there's an additional assessment on top of that uh, that is, functions like a tax that's 2%, so it's effectively 12.5%. So this would be an additional increase on top of that that is collected on hotel room bills for people who stay within these uh, hotel rooms in San Diego, the city of San Diego. So, Mr. McConnell, can you establish your credentials and why do you oppose this? So most people know me as a homeless advocate, but I've worked on the issue of homelessness in a variety of roles, researching, learning, volunteering, uh, funding uh, different aspects of the issue for about 10 years. I'm the former vice chair of the Regional Task Force on the Homeless. I'm a founding member of the Funders Together to End Homelessness San Diego. Uh, I was on the leadership team of an effort to end veteran homelessness here in San Diego for a couple of years. Uh, I've presented on this issue in San Diego and across the country in a variety of different uh, aspects, all the way from data uh, using data to drive systems change all the way to the criminalization of homelessness. I first got involved in this because the mayor back in 2017 was bringing forward an initiative on his own to this, through the city council process for the convention center and for the first time it included homelessness. So that's what caught my attention. And as somebody who, who is 100% independent and who just wants to learn and, and gather information on my own, I did what a normal citizen would do, and I hired a professional polling firm, right? Everybody would do that, right? Well, I did because I took this very seriously, like I do with everything that involves our community and homelessness and what I want to get involved with. So I hired some consultants, I hired a polling firm, and I wanted to find out, what did voters think? What do everyday San Diegans think about this new idea of attaching a convention center to homelessness funding? Well, what I found is they didn't think very much of this, and it helped guide what I'm thinking about this, and that it's the wrong approach for San Diego. It's a wrong approach for the convention center, and it's certainly a wrong approach if we really want to raise money for homelessness in a meaningful way. So that is how I've ended up on the other side of this and opposing this measure. Let me ask you this. So one of the things that I battle with is, for, I've been watching this debate for a long time, this discussion about expanding the convention center. And one of the things I always said is they need to come up with a clean way to just raise taxes, ask people if they want to raise taxes, and if they want to raise taxes to expand the convention center, then they approve it and they expand the convention center. Why would it get worse if you add funding for homelessness? Why would that make the measure worse to add funding to serve the needs of the hum homelessness population, the homeless. I'm asking you. So why do I personally think it's worse, or why do I think it's, or why do voters yeah, it's think almost it's like, worse? It's almost like what you've described is that uh, the, the funding for the homelessness actually turned you off, as opposed to if this was just a discussion about the, the convention center expansion. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of aspects to that. It's, it's just not the homelessness being part of this, it's the amount of money that's bringing in. And in the current iteration of the, the initiative, which is now a citizen's initiative, they realized that it needed to be a little bit more for homelessness, but it really just doesn't go far enough. But what I found was that the convention center is just a very low priority for San Diegans. San Diegans want solutions to our most pressing needs. They want solutions to homelessness. They want solutions to our water issues, to our road issues, to our infrastructure issues. Homelessness falls very far down on the priority list. I'm a believer that our TOT, potential TOT tax increase, is a public asset. It does not belong to any special interest group. It belongs to San Diegans who need certain things. And when I say need, there are folks who need affordable housing. There are folks who need basic needs. These are not folks who lay awake at night thinking about the size of the convention center and how many extra conventions it may bring in, which doesn't seem like it's going to be very much according to their own uh, studies. So that's really what's driving a lot of this is 
those different aspects of the measure. Got it. Do you want to address the conventions itself? Well, let me address two things. One is I appreciate uh, Michael's approach to having a poll uh, conducted. I, I, I think it's a, it's a unique way to practice citizenry, but um, I got to run a poll once too because I ran for office. And my poll told me I was going to win uh, city attorney. <laughs> so I don't put a whole lot of faith he, in he polls. He didn't win. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Lost. Th thanks, Scott. I don't yeah. think we no, I'm, I just wanted to clarify. To, I, had, I had context to these debates. That's I, I my just, goal. Just, yeah. just hurt a little, but that's fine. No, it's fine. Uh, so so the, the thing with polls is, is just that. It's a snapshot of what the electorate or the group of the electorate that you poll know in that particular moment. The way you pass policy, the way you get things done is by building coalitions, is by building groups, large groups of people that have a vested interest in policy and to get it passed. It's not just by saying, hey, what do you think of these issues, and seeing what's popular in that moment, and then putting a measure on and hoping it passes. Because what will happen is, if you don't bring a coalition together, then some group is going to be upset about it and is going to fight you on it. And in San Diego, we specialize in this. We are in unbelievably great at getting in our own way in the city of San Diego and the region. And so what, they have, what the citizens approached here was they took quality of life issues across the board that they thought we needed to address, and all three of them are things we need to address. They then built one of the largest coalitions I've seen since I've been here in my 20 years in San Diego that is supporting it. And these are people that do not agree. This is labor and business. They, you know, that doesn't happen very often. These are the hoteliers that are now in favor of raising taxes on the rooms that they rent. The last time a TOT initiative was put on the ballot for this purpose was after fires in the city of San Diego, major fires in the city of San Diego, and it was to raise money to help address fires. Hoteliers weren't on board, and the measure went down. You, you accomplish things by building a large coalition, and this gets you there. And that, that's why, to me, and I, I appreciate the work Michael does, but to me, I've, I've never understood the opposition, because it gets you $147 million for homeless services, for homeless uh, projects in the first five years and $2 billion over the course of the uh, life of the uh, bonds, or sorry, of the tax. And in the last two panels, I don't know if you were at the last two panels on homelessness, but the last two panels on homelessness, everybody said we need funding, we need a dedicated funding source, and we need it now. And so to me, this addresses that. Yeah, so uh, let me ask you a version of that. And what bad thing happens if they pass this? What, what's the what's the negative consequence that comes from this? Are you uh, that you you want to stop from happening? Well, now we're going to have to go to the measure itself. So the the citizens' initiative that is before the city council is riddled with. Hold that mic up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. So the citizens' initiative as written before the city council is riddled with loopholes. If we care about homelessness funding, we will not pass it. There's no guarantee one unit of housing will be built. There's no guarantee one dollar would be spent on homelessness. The measure has, is able to be changed by the city council and money is able to be moved from one bucket into another. We know, we've seen it before, Massive projects like this have cost overruns. I don't even know if there's a, a truly up-to-date cost projection for this. I haven't seen anything on the, the proponent's website. You're talking about the convention center expansion. The convention You're center expansion. You're saying that that would cost more and thus take away from these funds. We've certainly seen it before. Not only could it take away all of the money in the measure, it might end up attacking our general fund. And if nothing else, there's a weak supplantation clause in the measure itself. There's no guarantee that there will be any net increase in homelessness funding at all. They could simply replace existing general fund money with this money. There's a lot, I, there's numerous reasons to oppose this. And quite honestly, it doesn't matter how large your coalition is, if the coalition is pushing a product that is deeply flawed. I think we're coming off uh, a recent tax measure called Measure A. We saw a pretty large coalition, many of the same members, that are now pushing this. 
Thankfully, the public saw through that. The voters saw through that and voted it down. Otherwise, we would be in a tremendous mess today with Measure A. Now, the measure does now um, set aside for the first five years, I believe, funding for homelessness. Uh, do you not buy that or not accept that as a fact? No, the projections are, it's, it's, the whole measure is projected out of where the funding will go. There are three very specific buckets, three very specific accounts. But when you can change the measure, there could be one bucket. I'm not saying that will happen. We, don't, we can't predict the future. Voters want accountability and transparency. They do not want loosely worded initiatives that can be manipulated by politicians who want to take money from one project to another for whatever reason. Over and over I hear, and it's not just polling. By the way, it's multiple polling. And it's not just polling. It's, it's communications with many folks in the community. Many of them who see through this. It's, it's pretty transparently not good for our city. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? So, uh, you know, we live in a republic. Right, so we elect our city officials to make these decisions on spending and everything else. So first of all, the measure does provide where money goes. It can be amended, he's absolutely right. But Michael, today, there's, they can do whatever they want with homeless funding. Right now, with almost any measure that you will find, which almost, with almost any effort that you will find, a city council that has control of their budget, which all of them do, can move money around in a crisis. What this does is make it politically difficult to do so. Because somebody like you is gonna, and me, frankly, is gonna scream to high heaven if the politicians move the money from what the people told them to do it. And if they do it, then you and I will be on a similar coalition to get them the hell out of office. So I don't see that the flexibility of the measure as a bug so much as a feature because, so when I was in college, um, in, the, in the CSU system, they uh, raised tuition 100% from the moment I was a freshman to the moment I was a senior. Now, you'll all laugh because that meant that my tuition went from $600 a year to $1,200 a year. And, and, but, you know, when you're a student and on a fixed amount of money, we thought that was crazy. And so we went up to Sacramento and we were trying to tell these politicians, what the hell are you doing raising our tuition? And you know, one of the things that's a big problem in the state budget is so much of it is totally locked up by measures and initiatives that the state legislature can't actually be flexible in its funding when it needs to move money one place or the other to address a problem. So flexibility to me in a republic is not a bad thing and the way we hold them accountable is by voting them out of office. Can I touch on the convention portion? I was just gonna ask you to. <laughs> um, so we were born on the same day, so you know the minds. But the... Um, a couple of years earlier. Shut up. <laughs> Sorry, it's just. Hey, remember when you lost that election and how much younger I am? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, uh, uh, the way the convention center business works right now, we are one of the busiest convention centers in the world, frankly, and for sure in the country. We're, um, it's a place that you really can't get into if you want to bring a convention to town. So my point on expansion is very simple. We leave money on the table if we don't expand the convention center. And it's not money that comes to the convention center, it's money that comes to the voters because the TOT tax that our attendees spend goes right into the general fund. And, and last year that was $26 million under the most conservative estimate that you can make. And that doesn't count the economic impact that sort of flows from all the jobs and everything else. That's just straight taxes, $26 million. Even soaking wet, if you count what the convention center is given by the general fund, you're still netting about $12 million a year today. When the measure passes within a year, that goes up because right now $4 million that the city spends on the convention center just gets shifted over to the direct revenue from the measure. So that's an extra $4 million you can spend on things like homeless services. We are full. We are so full that when I need to fix the building, it's hard to find a date to fix the building. Right now, we have locked in reservations for our building that is signed contracts through 2035. We have soft holds, that is people thinking they want to come here, through the 2040s. That's how full we are. That's how much people want to come to our center. So you don't have to expand it, but not expanding it just 
stops the Golden Goose from delivering more money to the city of San Diego. Let me um, push on that a little bit. So are, they're not creating new conventions in the world, are they? Like, it's not a growing biz, it's not a growing industry of people getting together. If anything, it's probably just shifting with technology and such, correct? Well, I, it, it's not actually shifting so much. The, the interesting thing, I, I, you know, for when I first got into the convention center uh, board, I wasn't, I don't have a background in hospitality, and so I had to learn everything. And I, I thought the same thing. I said, look, you know, we're going to do telemeetings, we're going to do conference calls, we're going to do all this stuff. But think about the last time you went on a, con on a, on a business trip, a convention trip, a, um, some sort of uh, conference that you went to. <laughs> it's a little bit cynical, but people will never stop going to these things. <laughs> no, I, no, I get that, but I, I mean, <laughs> they, they it's, not like a, it's not like it's not like uh, biotech or social media. It's not like exploding in scale. It's it's a it's a pretty set industry, right? Right, which makes it competitive to bring the convention. So, but here. that's my question. So, like, if there's if it's a pie, are we really just trying to fight with other cities to protect our slice of the pie, or are we really saying we're going to be able to pull? conventions that are currently going to other cities and what guarantee do you have that that's going to happen well our our booking history fully guarantees that that will happen but let me give you one example the society of hematologists is one of our biggest conventions in town that's ash the what the association no the american society of hematologists the okay. blood doctors right so that's one of our biggest conventions um they go uh yearly uh from region to region so they do one on the east coast one in the middle one on the west right so before they, they had come to San Diego, and then the next stop was Atlanta. And Atlanta is a bigger convention center. So the Society of Hematology actually made that association, and, and these annual conferences are how these associations actually make money for their budgets. So the Society for Hematology made $6 million more in Atlanta than they could in San Diego, because Atlanta's convention center is bigger so they can get more vendors onto their show floor. And that's how they get money in these conventions. Now, next time they have to look at San Diego, they'll look at San Diego, they'll look at LA, they'll look at San Francisco. San Francisco's bigger, Anaheim's bigger. And they'll be like, gosh, last year we made, I'm pulling numbers out here, but last year we made $30 million. If we go back to San Diego, we're only gonna make $24 million. If we go back, if we go to Anaheim, we can make the same $30 million we made in Atlanta. Those are the decisions that these show planners are making. So yeah, we, we, we will lose conventions we have, and right now there are numerous conventions, cardiologists is one of them, uh, there's a show called Light Fair that's another one, that don't even look at San Diego anymore because we're too small. And these are conventions that we should have. I think what I hear you saying is that you're fine with a hotel room tax increase if we had more protections for where the money was going to go and if it truly funded the homeless services you think we need. Is that fair? Well, I think there's more to it. And I'll push back a little bit on, on some of the stuff you've heard. Uh, nobody can tell us what the net revenues, tax revenues are to the city because all they're talking about are the tax flows into the city. Nobody's talking about the additional cost that the city has to pay when, when we do these things, where it's expanding the convention center and infrastructure, fire, police, safety, those types of things. So none of that is factored in. Please also keep in mind that as Scott was saying, there's a fixed amount of these conventions. Billions of dollars is currently being spent to improve and enlarge convention centers across the country. They will continue to have a competitive, at least an equal competitiveness to us because they are already doing it. They are already improving their convention centers. At best, it sounds like to me, we're trying to hold on to what we have. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having to discount hotel space or convention center space. If it was that great of a place, we could charge more. We wouldn't have to run deficits. We wouldn't have to subsidize the convention center. It would pay for itself. It does come close, but it's not this cash cow that people want to make it seem like. And this money that's being brought, the money of the TOT tax, what else could it do to actually maybe bring in more money, more revenues to the city. We have Balboa Park, which is crumbling. It is a huge visitor draw to our city. There are lots of things that nobody has looked at spending this money on 
that could actually be a bigger net benefit to the city. So it's really not just the homelessness part of this. This is really getting to be the whole measure. And there are ways to move forward. We can raise the TOT just for the general fund. And then the city council through another process would have to decide on where that money is spent. There are other ways to do this that does not allow the hotel and the tourism industry to maintain the grasp on what I consider a public asset. So but, I, but now, I'm sorry, but now you're talking out of both sides of your mouth because in the front end of the discussion you said the problem with this measure is that the city council can move all this money around. Now you just said what we need is a measure that allows the city council to just move all the money around. You can't have it both ways. It's, it, it can't be bad if it's a measure you're okay with, but the city council can still move the money around, but, or good if that's the situation, or, and bad if it's a measure you're not okay with. On the funding thing, let me be clear. I was the chairman of the budget committee of the convention center. I presented to council every, uh, every time we presented it. The city of San Diego nets money from the convention center. What, is com what comes out of the general fund to pay for the convention center? There are three things. One is the phase two bonds that are still being paid. Those will be paid through the late 2020s for the phase two expansion. That's about 10, 12 million dollars, rough numbers. Second is what's called dewatering. Uh, the center was built in such a way that our underground parking uh, garage, the second level, uh, water comes in from the bay. It's then processed and then put back in the bay. Uh, city pays for that, that's about $800,000 a year. The third thing that the city pays for directly from the general fund is a direct uh, payment to the convention center of about $3 million a year that goes to market the convention center. What the convention center does with that is it takes that money and it gives it to the tourism authority and then they sell the building all over the world. That's about $14 million a year out of the general fund. Our direct attendee spend, and the way I know this, is that we hire a third party to come in every two years and talk to our attendees and get a statistically significant sampling to find out how much they spend when they're in San Diego as a result of a convention that they're there for. Based on that attendee spend, the city then gets, 20, last year, got $26.3 million in general TOT increase. So, 26.3 minus 14, $12 million net uh, profit to the city from the convention center. The hotel room discounts, have you ever gone to a wedding and there's a block of rooms you get, uh, right? And the block of room is discounted, right? Because you've, you're reserving a block. Well, that's what happens when a convention comes to town. They get a block of rooms and they get a discount on the rate and that, they get that every city in the world will do that. Any hotel, when you bring a group of people to their hotel, will give you a discounted rate. And so that's the discounted rate that we're talking about. And usually when we discount the rate, by the way, we have a minimum guarantee of food and beverage that they have to spend in the building, which goes to the convention center, which goes to tax TOT, uh, so that they get the discounted rate. So the convention center folks would like, to, like you to believe that if there wasn't a convention in town, the hotels would be empty, the streets would be empty, nobody would be in San Diego. Raise your hand if you believe that. So what does the convention business will do is we'll crowd out folks when there's a convention in town because they do get the big room blocks. Uh, but people would fill our hotels, they would fill our streets. They might even fill them more if we actually invested in the things that they want to do when they come into town. Now certainly conventions is a business. I'm not arguing that. It could possibly be a dying business. We don't know that. There's, nobody has a crystal ball to tell you that this $3.8 billion is going to pay off. It's a gamble to some degree. It is absolutely a gamble to some degree. Well, you just, Wait. sorry. <laughs> no, no, uh, you moderate, I'll stay there and relax. I got this. Um, <laughs> so, oh, by the way, have you come up with the name? For the convention for the center? No, I, I Come can't, on, I can't. don't let us down here. Say, say it the way you said it on the podcast. We like that. No, it's good. Come on. I'm, I'm being respectful. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things I've watched, I've watched them try to raise the hotel room tax in San Diego since 2004. There was two measures in 2004. One 
was supported by everybody, including the hotel industry, except for one hotelier named Doug Manchester. And he came in at the last moment and was able to influence it so it didn't get to two-thirds. It got a solid majority, but not two-thirds. Later in the year, they tried to raise the hotel room tax again, this time just, led by Donna Fry, just for the general fund of the city of San Diego, just as you said they should. And it was panned even harder and did not even get to 50%. Uh, I've watched them discuss this over the years. Whether we like it or not, the hotel industry has a certain power over hotel room taxes. They're willing to spend money to make sure that the ones they don't like don't happen. Do you not see any value in, in working with them to compromise, to come up with something that they do want, this convention center or something like it, in order to raise the hotel room tax? Do you really think there's a way to raise it without their support? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I guess we can just go through life here in San Diego letting hoteliers and tourism officials control these things. I, I prefer not to and am willing to spend my time and money to make sure that doesn't happen. I did, though, however, participate in discussions early on, and two of my main things was that uh, homelessness dollars be sufficient in any kind of measure that I'm going to support, and they be locked in. Neither is really happening here. It's not that it's not some sort of meaningful about amount of money. It, it, it is. It's, it's still just a fraction of what we already spend, though. And there's not really a plan to it. It really is about pretty much everything in the kitchen sink is under the homelessness section. Uh, once again, I, I don't think that's going to fly very far. People want some sort of certainty to what they're going to get. And like I said, there's not even any guarantee that one unit of housing will get built from this measure. And as you've heard today, if you've gone in through any of the homelessness uh, pieces today, housing is the solution. And this measure doesn't guarantee any, not one unit. Let me ask you about that. So I, I have been rather surprised to see a lot of Republicans support a tax increase that has no plan for how the spending is going to be doled out. And, and it's, it's touted as, as a feature, not a bug of it, that it doesn't have a plan. And so I, my mind is kind of jarred by that because of watching these debates for the last 15 years, that comes up all the time. We need serious oversight of how the money is going to be spent and serious assurances of how the money is going to be spent. Why is that? okay to sort of, I'm not saying you're a Republican, I know you're not, but Thank you. You, you care about fiscal responsibility. Why is this something everybody's so willing to push aside as far as guarantees about where the money's going to go, plan for how it's going to be spent, and then uh, ways to hold it accountable? Well, again, the measure is structured in a way that does put buckets of money for certain things, the three, the three things we're talking about. Convention center, homelessness, and uh, streets. So there is a, a structure to it. And again, it, it takes a significant amount of political risk and capital to change that, I think, once the voters pass it. In terms of the plan, I mean, I literally just came from, a, a, from one of your panels where they discussed San Diego's plan. Uh, and that was. Will that plan guide this funding? Yeah. I, I, what assurances I, do we have about that, though? Well, because the, the city council passed the plan, and it's that city council that's going to determine how this money is spent um, for it. So again, at the end of the day, your issues are with your city council if the money isn't spent the way you think it should be spent. They're the people that, that we elect to make these decisions. And so we've guided them. We've told them, look, you're going to spend 40% uh, of this money for homelessness in the first uh, five years, and, and then they have this plan that they just passed. And again, if, if they don't go down that path and don't spend that money, then I'll be the first one to stand right next to Michael and say, this is ridiculous. But, you know, I would be pretty shocked to see a city council, and certainly a majority of the city council, just ignore what this initiative mandates and the, this, the very plan that they just passed. And by the way, that plan requires $1.9 billion over the next 10 years. We have to find funding sources for this money. This isn't all of it. I agree with you. We need more of it. 
But this is a good first step in that direction and a significant chunk of it right out of the gate. I would just say, watch how fast they abandon the homelessness and other funding when they have a half-built convention center expansion. Well, one, one thing on the, because you said there's no guarantees in this. Every, if you go back in time to every projection that's ever been made of what the TOT number is going to be um, in the future, it's always wrong. Not in the direction he thinks, in the other direction. It's always way higher than we thought it was going to be. And to, about the compression thing, when the point about the convention drowns out all the other conventions, take ho discounted hotel rooms for, uh, from the hoteliers um, when the conventions are in town, because you know we're San Diego, we fill our, our hotels all the time. Do we really think the hoteliers would want to expand the entity that does that to their hotel room rates if it didn't bring more hotel room nights? It's great in San Diego in July for hotels. It's awesome. You'd be surprised how well hotels don't do in December, in November, in January, in February, and in March. Then it picks up again. We fill those hotels in the down months. We also fill them in the up months, but we fill them in the down months. Well, just look at the rates during Comic-Con. So it's more than just filling hotel rooms. It's also gouging the people who are coming here. Well, that, so again, talking about both sides of your mouth, we have a hotel room block for Comic-Con. Those are discounted rooms. So if you're coming to Comic-Con, you go through this really fun thing called the hotel apocalypse, hotel apocalypse, hotel apocalypse, something like that. Where you Hi, hotel apocalypse? Ho hotel apocalypse. Thank you. See, wordsmith, this guy, uh, and you uh, you put your uh, name in to get the hotels that are discounted throughout. There are absolutely hotels that are gouging people at Comic Con. That is totally true. I would love to bring them into the hotel room block. You know, they run their own businesses and they fight us on that. But every year is a is a fight to bring more and more rooms into the Comic Con hotel room block. And if you've ever been in the gas lamp during Comic-Con, and, and let's remember, Comic-Con is one event out of over 100 events that happen in our building every year. I love it. I'm a huge nerd. Everybody know, he knows this. Everybody knows this. Uh, but it's one event. Um, but if you're downtown during Comic-Con, I mean, you, you can't tell me that this building does not bring economic prosperity to this city. It's crazy the amount of spending that's going on in this city during that time period. I have some things I want to ask about that, but I want to ask you, um, Michael, about, uh, you mentioned you funded a poll already. Are you prepared to invest resources in, in actually opposing this in a campaign style campaign? Yes. Uh, okay. Like, uh, why does it, um, why has it reached something that you feel personally obligated to, uh, to, to deploy resources on? Well, like I said, this is a public asset. It's time that we bring it back to the public for the needs and priorities of everyday San Diegans. And I think the best way to do that is to stop this measure and to move forward with something that does address everyday San Diegans' needs and priorities. And it, really, I would just ask the opposition to actually, if you can't, come back with reasonable answers to the, the loopholes in this measure. It's not just about talking out of both sides of my mouth. My arguments obviously make sense, and they just can't rebut them. The points I'm making are very solid. It's not, the point is, why would hoteliers want to fund the convention center? It's obviously because they'll get higher rates. There's there's really good points that we can debate about on this, but if you don't have an answer to come back, it's really not just about insulting people about what they have to say. So that, I'm, I, I don't mean to be insulting or anything, but that, that right there um, is the reason that things don't get done in San Diego. One person with resources, like Mr. McConnell, like Mr. Manchester, that decide, no, no, I alone know better than this broader coalition of people, and so I'm gonna put in my personal wealth and convince enough San Diegans to sink this thing. And then we go another year and nothing gets done. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, 
that this can happen. And you know, it's a democracy, and, and he can make the choices he wants to make. But when, if this fails, I don't think it's going to fail. But if this fails, um, you know, then we don't have additional money for homelessness. We don't have additional money for our streets. We've capped the amount of money we're bringing into the convention center. And you know, the 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 personal confidence of one person to sit, think that that you know, you, you know better than everybody else and can sink a measure because you have the resources to me is astounding. Why, if this is such a great thing, why hasn't this been passed with just the hotel or the convention center? Why, why, why has homelessness had to be included on this? Let's look at who their partners are, who they took money from, the private prison industry. So, yes, I'm going to spend my money how I want to based on not just how I feel, but how a lot of people feel, how voters feel. So to say that this is about me on a one-man crusade, I've looked at how people feel. So just because you have a, a large group of very influential people pushing this forward, and in some cases bullying other organizations that won't even go along with them. So not only taking private prison money, but then bullying organizations that are in our communities helping immigrants to not go against them. It's not a one-man crusade. Let's put some context into what you say. I would like you to respond. So um, I think what you were referencing was some of the nonprofits who felt like they um, couldn't push uh, hard for a November ballot uh, measure as opposed to March, which the mayor and others preferred, uh, based on uh, Measure L from past a couple of years ago, and um, and there was some significant pressure put on some of the more liberal groups from labor and other groups, uh, and then he also mentioned a donation that the campaign got from uh, a company called GEO about uh, they do do private um, prisons. Uh, do you want to address either of those points? Um, so again, I'm not affiliated with the campaign but so I, everything I know about this is you know from what I read on from a, a what fantastic I from, from what website, I read yes, on this yeah. incredible uh, yeah. small little outfit that's a website No it's an important it's institution a, in Yeah San Diego. I mean they do good work they're they're a, they're plucky it's a, it's a, you know they're plucky very but, valuable uh, public institution Absolutely absolutely So the uh, uh, so the 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 prison thing I look I I agree I I hate these damn institutions I I think that uh, Dostoevsky was right Right. The degree of any civilization can be measured by how we treat our prisoners. Um, and we suck at that as a, as a civilization. So I, you know, I would like to ban those organizations, a real ban, by the way, not the one that we have, but an actual ban that bans them. Um, and so I, I, but I was happy to read yesterday in, in that little publication of yours that, uh, that it, the campaign has given that money back. And I think it was important to, to highlight that because we shouldn't be taking money from that. I, I'll, I'll, I'll also remind everybody of Jess Unruh's favorite uh, sit, uh, statement, Jess Unruh was one of our past speakers in California, and he always said, if you can't take their money and something else and drink their liquor and then vote against them, then you shouldn't be in this business. I skipped the middle one because that's no longer... <laughs> Those that know it, know it. Um, so, uh, so that's that. But I, I think it was the right call to give that money to, to some of these homeless nonprofits. Is the general assumption on the people who support the measure that you need two-thirds of the vote in March, or is... Where are we at with that? Well, I think the safest thing to do is to get two thirds, and I know that that's what um, I'm hoping that the that we'll get in terms of the 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 numbers and what the folks at the campaign. My understanding that is that they're shooting to get two thirds. Um, there's one uh, Supreme Court case out there that um, opens the door. Um, the logic the logic's sound in terms of the way they look at it. Um, and there's one uh, trial court case in San Francisco that has said the Supreme Court said. Um, went this way, and so we agree it's a 50% vote if it's a citizen's initiative. The appellate courts are gonna make that decision and it probably will go up all the way up to the Supreme Court again. So for me, the safe path, the path that, that reduces the amount of litigation and time to get to is to get to two thirds. So one of the, um, uh, this is one of my favorite things to explain, so just a sec. So um, in California, if you want to say build a stadium with new taxes, you need to get two thirds of the vote to get a so-called special tax. But if you just want to raise a tax to give the money to the government to use as they, as they see appropriate, that's a general tax, which means you only need 50% of the vote. So it's, it seems uh, backwards because uh, 
if you have more assurity of where the money is going to go, maybe you should have less. But that's why it's that way. They wanted to make it as hard as possible to pass those taxes. And that's why in 2004, they only needed 50% of the vote to raise the taxes for the general needs of the city of San Diego, and they weren't able to do that. So I followed with that question about would you use your money on this? Would you further use resources to try to build a new effort to pass a hotel room tax or something else to fund the kind of services and plan that you do believe in. Sure, yeah. But I think while we're on the lawsuits, I mean, uh, the city and the convention center, the port, they're currently being sued over this, being sued over a payment that they made to the people who actually control the property where they want to expand the convention center. So this is already tied up in court, and it's not even on the ballot. So it, once again, it's not one person's crusade. This, this measure is rift with problems. Let's talk about the, the actual layout of the convention center. So what he's referring to is a piece of land on the bay side of the convention center, the 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue landing. Uh, that is the lease for that is controlled by two men who want to build a, a hotel there. That hotel is in various stages of delay. But if they were to succeed to build that hotel on that land, they would get a long-term lease for it, and it would block the expansion that you all have envisioned for the convention center for some time. Now, it seems like there's some consensus of some kind that the city could expand the convention center and deal with this issue, but it's caught them up before and cost the city tens of millions of dollars before. From your purchase at the convention center corporation, what could you tell people to assure them that the city's not marching down another conflict that could squeeze millions of dollars out of taxpayers' uh, coffers you know, to, to resolve once again? Well, I, I think it speaks a lot that, um, so the city, uh, FAL, um, I think the convention center is a party technically, but, but it's really the city, the FAL, and the port reached a settlement on that land. There was a, a structure for the acquisition of that land, and the city has paid some money for the acquisition of that land. I think it's instructive that um, the hotel that, that the two gentlemen are proposing has not moved forward. Um, every time there's a hearing on it uh, in front of the port, it's delayed. Um, and the other thing that gives me some solace is this. To build the hotel, you need to amend the port master plan. To amend the port master plan, you need six votes on the port of board commissioners. San Diego holds three seats on the port of board commissioners. You cannot get six votes to amend the port master plan without one of those San Diego commissioners voting for it. So just three people can stop an important project. Three appointed officials, yeah, yeah, that's their job. Okay. Um. <laughs> well, my job is to hold those appointed officials accountable, and that's what I intend to do. I appreciate that. Let's, um, let's bring this home. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes each to make your closing arguments. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I think I've made a lot of the arguments. There's a lot more. I mean, we could probably sit and talk about this for quite a while. Uh, when it comes down to it, this is not the right measure. This is not the right way. We need real solutions. Everybody knows that. Everybody wants that. I just ask how many of y'all lay awake at night, sleep, losing sleep about expanding the convention center. Uh, let's put our money, let's put our efforts into the San Diegans' high priorities and needs. We know we need to address homelessness. We know we need a lot more money than what this measure can deliver. We know we need guaranteed money for homelessness and infrastructure. This is going to lead us down a path that we potentially cannot recover from. Half-built expansions, they're gonna get the money from somewhere. Is it gonna be our parks, our libraries? There's just no guarantees to this. So we need to protect our general fund. We need to protect our communities. So the famous quote is, no, there's no guarantees in life but death and taxes. Um, nothing that he proposes, nothing that anybody proposes can ever guarantee perfection. And that's the problem with, with what we do here. We are really good at getting in our way, and the way we do that is by making perfect the enemy of the good. 
we are always saying, you know, this isn't quite right. This isn't the thing that we wanted. This, this, this person doesn't like it. This group doesn't like it. We're never going to get anything done as a city that way. We're going to just keep having San Diego, what do we call them, San Diego specials? Is that yes. what we, did we decide on that, San Diego specials? Yeah, a little Sa publication came up with that. Sa yeah, that, that lovely website. Uh, uh, I am a member, so, you know. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> but I'd like to get to that place where we actually start building stuff, where we actually start putting our, our resources where we need them. You know, we can, we can fight about whether or not this is the perfect measure. I, I, you know, I can, I can, I'm a lawyer. I can, I can argue your side as well. It's fun. But, you know, this is put together by, again, one of the broadest coalitions of groups I've ever seen. And, you know, you, you can say that it's all these special interests and stuff like that, but there was a line of plumbers, carpenters, uh, you know, craftsmen lining up uh, when the, we signed uh, the support for this uh, measure just a few weeks ago at a, at a press conference. You know, I don't think of them as special interests. I just think of those as, as San Diegans with good jobs that want more good jobs. So this convention center produces revenue for the city of San Diego that we get to use for police, fire, our parks, and everything else. This measure gets us $147 million in the first five years, $2 billion over the course of the measure for homelessness. On top of that, the increase in TOT revenue that you're going to get from the more conventions that are coming to the building. And, you know, if everybody listened to the folks that says, we're never going to finish the convention center, we're never going to do this, we're never going to do that, we would build nothing. We would not have Horton Plaza, we would not have revitalized downtown, uh, we would not have built the ballpark, which revitalized the East Village. Uh, we would not have finished the library. The library was one of those things people kept saying, we're never going to finish this. It's going to be half built. You're going to have this dome that's half built. Now, they fi factor that into the architecture of the dome and say, no, no, we, we want it to be half built because it just shows that we're progress. But again, if the naysayers that, that, that have the fear, uncertainty, and doubt on every major public project that we do have their way, we build nothing. We do nothing. We just stand still and talk about all the problems we have in San Diego that we sure, sure wish we could have fixed, but gosh, we've gone through this for 20 years talking about how we should fix this, and then we don't fix it. Let's fix it. Let's pass this measure. Okay, I want to thank uh, the, the sponsor for this session, Charter Communications. Uh, the sponsors have really made a beautiful event come together today, and I can't uh, thank them enough for, for making that possible. All of the members of Voice of San Diego who are here, thank you so much. Uh, there's two on the stage and many of you out there that make it, make it possible. And I would like to give uh, a round of applause for these guys. Um, it is, uh, it's not easy to come and put yourself out and, and expose uh, you know, your vulnerabilities and your ideas. And, and uh, it means a lot to me that you're both willing to do that. Um, stay tuned. In this uh, room, we'll have the uh, mayoral debate in a Voice of San Diego podcast special way. That'll be coming up. And thank you all for coming again. All right. Thanks for listening to this uh, bonus episode of the Voice of San Diego podcast. Make sure you keep an eye on your podcast feed. We're going to be posting a lot of the other panels from PolitiFest. Don't forget to join us for our weekly roundup of local news every Friday afternoon in the main feed with the Voice of San Diego podcast itself. 